Hey, uh, Courtney, it, it dawned on me um, that you asked about the modern state of Israel in relation to what we're seeing in Romans. And uh, it's a really important question. And, and you graciously said, you know, we might take this up in a future module. It's one of those things that I haven't quite figured out, to be honest with you, how to incorporate into this class. Because I, I think that it's, you know, near the front of a lot of our minds as we're reading um, Romans and dealing with the issues of the letter. And, you know, because of the geopolitics of our time and the rhetoric around the state of Israel that is prevalent in public discourse and especially among certain sectors of the Christian church, not least the evangelical church, um, you know, a lot of our kind of working through this is actually uh, an attempt to navigate the, the terrain of this public discourse. Um, so I, I think I do want to try to say a few things about that and here at this point um, in the class, and I will try to tie it to some of what we've been seeing, but it's not really particularly relevant to this section more than others. It's really systemically relevant, I would say, to our interpretation of the whole letter insofar as the whole letter deals with the reality of the people of God its relation to land, you know, all of those kinds of things. And I have an article that maybe I'll try to link um, in an announcement to, I may have already included in this class or maybe plan to include it later. I can't remember, but it's an article I wrote actually for a Jewish journal called Shofar um, that is called Torn Between Earth and Sky, uh, National Jewish Homeland. So I'll link that so that you can look at that if you want in case it's helpful. But uh, Israel as a modern nation state. I think that's the first thing that is important to highlight that when we talk about uh, the state of Israel today, we're talking about a relatively young country that is the product of a much more widespread, mostly Western, but not entirely Western movement of nationalization consolidating otherwise quite diverse populations into a national identity that is typically tied, not always, but typically tied to a particular territory with relatively definite boundaries, um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Jews have, of course, been living uh, in many places of the world and some in the Middle East, um, including in what is now the land of Israel, although a very small number for uh, centuries and centuries. So it's not as if um, Israel suddenly came into existence in 1948. Uh, we have to see that when the Bible talks about the people of Israel, it's talking about the sprawling social reality dispersed across the known world that calls out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as their God. And Jews are an important subpopulation of that reality, but not the entirety of that reality. So um, with that in mind, we can maybe think a little bit about uh, the modern state of Israel specifically. I think that there are a whole host of liabilities that have come with the movement of nationalization that has taken over the planet, really, the human uh, population of the planet uh, over the course of the last 250 to 300 years. Um, liabilities uh, that are, I think, relatively obvious. Um, but with this movement has come uh, a kind of romanticism about countries, about um, they're embodying a sort of ideal about there being kind of the final uh, political order that everybody has to embrace. And in that way, the modern state of Israel becomes a kind of fixture in the Christian theological imagination as if what the Bible says about Israel were about the modern state of Israel. And I think that is a mistake. We've got to observe a distinction, even if we do want to recognize that the modern state of Israel is indeed one expression among many historically 
of the reality of Israel, one that has, as I'm saying, a variety of liabilities. Now, I think it's always important in these conversations to um, not lose sight of the Shoah, uh, as Jews call it, the Holocaust, as others of us typically call it, as not the driving force, but a driving force of what the modern state of Israel has been. And of course, the Holocaust was the culmination of a long history of Christian persecution of Jews, pogroms in Eastern Europe and elsewhere that motivated the movement of Zionism in the late 19th century to seek a uh, Jewish territorial homeland. And um, the Middle East was not the only place that was considered by Jews in Eastern Europe at that time. Um, other places were also considered, but uh, the movement did end up settling on uh, the Middle East um, for a variety of reasons. And so the, the, what I'm getting at, though, is that there's a real sense in which that has been a refuge for Jews um, who were uh, threatened rather unspeakably um, by Christian and post-Christian powers based in Europe, um, as well as some of the Middle East. So... I don't want to minimize that threat in the way that I criticize um, the state of Israel, um, especially with some of the ways, as you mentioned, that it has approached the presence of Palestinians that um, predate uh, a great deal of the Jewish migration to the land um, and deserves uh, justice in terms of how Palestinians are able to inhabit uh, land that should be considered um, homeland for them as well. Um, how does Israel relate to land? Well, that's part of what that article torn between earth and sky is about. I do think that it's important to recognize that in the Bible, uh, you can't conceive of the people of Israel apart from homeland on the earth. Uh, but that does not mean that Israel as a sprawling people is kind of entitled uh, unconditionally to territorial dominance or sovereignty in what we might think of the historic promised land. Uh, in fact, Israel's ability to inhabit the land peaceably is dependent quite clearly not on Israel's military strength, but on the uh, its ability to be faithful to the law, to love God and to love one another. That's actually the hope of Israel's ability to inhabit the land peaceably over generations. And so now I would say that that should um, remain a concern as we engage with one another about um, Jewish life uh, in Israel, um, Jewish occupation of uh, certain lands that are in that region. Um, it's not that we want to threaten uh, Jews with exile again, but I think um, we should uh, demand, uh, hopefully first of ourselves and where we're living, but by extension, um, especially because of geopolitical relationships um, with the country of Israel, demand that the way that Israel um, governs land, and relates to the specific promised land be characterized by the justice of Israel's own Jewish traditions um, and to not allow those to be co-opted by um, modern nationalist uh, movements that have really no regard for biblical teaching about how to inhabit land. Um, the other thing I guess I'll say uh, just to close is that I don't think the promised land has definitive geographical borders. Um, I don't think that it is borderless either. So I'm trying to get at something a little subtle here. Um, but the key about the promised land is I think that it is a land trust that God means to expand. Meaning that uh, the particular land of Canaan uh, between the great rivers of Mesopotamia and the Mediterranean, the Fertile Crescent in there. Um, that's the, the land of Canaan, uh, of the sort of Davidic kingdom, uh, sort of what is promised Abraham and his uh, 
future family. But the key is that borders in those days were not like they are now, a sort of neat line in the sand that you cross over. They're, they're kind of, uh, they're a little bit more uh, inexact. And the vision, I think, of the prophets is actually that the promised land expands um, so that the future of the world is not, you know, all of Israel being gathered peaceably into the territory of Israel and the rest of the world being gathered in the rest of the known world peaceably, but actually an integration of Israel and the Gentile peoples who, in the words of Micah and then Isaiah after him, uh, stream to Mount Zion to learn the law of Jacob as their own, uh, so that the land trust of Israel uh, becomes a kind of um, staging ground for God to bless the entire earth. So I think the vision of the prophets is finally for the promised land to encompass all of creation, believe it or not. And um, how we negotiate that should not trample on needed distinctions along the way um, that encourage, um, you know, uh, healthy uh, boundaries uh, for um, respecting one another, um, giving one another space, uh, that kind of thing. But I don't think we should absolutize boundaries, especially the nationalized ones that we've inherited, but see them as porous distinctions that we want to address, work on, uh, so that there is a healthy flow of human and other life across them in a way that is of mutual benefit to people living on either side of them. And finally, perhaps um, giving way to uh, a way of inhabiting the land that is not characterized by any borders, but um, the blessings of God on the promised land fill the whole earth as the water fills the sea. Uh, roughly, that's kind of how I see things in the Bible. Um, lots of issues here. You might want to ask some questions about them. Uh, happy to keep this conversation going, but I hope this is a good primer to get us going on really an important topic as we think about Romans. And of course, one thing that's at the top of my mind as I close here is the tendency of Christians to be very judgy <laughs> about Israeli treatment of, pas of Palestinians, which is atrocious, uh, let's be clear. But turning a blind eye to the way our own um, places, many of us where we live, governments are treating uh, subordinated populations within our national borders and policing international borders in a way that is devastatingly oppressive. In the US, we'd be talking especially, of course, about the Mexican border and the way that the US has related to the flow of Latino life across that border um, in a hypocritical way because of how we will allow uh, capital to flow from the U.S. to Latino lands in a way that exploits them, um, exposes them to all kinds of vulnerability that then encourages the migration that then, especially white people, are prone to complain about north of the border. Uh, so don't want to lose sight of that and light of what Paul's teaching us about hypocrisy in Romans. Thanks again for a great question.